Book of Mormon, uh, which is, do you know my second cousin wrote this? Or my third cousin. Oh, really? This guy, Robert Lopez, who's like kind of related to me, but really not related to me. And him and his wife probably want nothing to do with me. They're New York uh, theater people. Theater people. Uh, Book of Mormon, the Tony-winning musical uh, comedy by Trey Parker, Matt Stone, and Robert Lopez. So he's the he's the music. Okay. He, he writes the music. He wrote uh, Let It Go mm -hmm. uh, for Frozen. He wrote the music for Frozen. He wrote uh, Avenue Q. Um. The show's irreverent depiction of Africans has been much discussed topic in theater circles since matters of Broadway's entrenched racism took on a renewed scrutiny followed last summer's BLM protest. In a People TV interview, original cast member Josh Gad asked about a potential film adaptation said, I don't know that the show could open today and have the same sort of open arm response that it did then. It's not to say that it's less significant or wonderful or incredible as a musical. I just think the nature of the art to adapt isn't it a book about Mormons who are ridiculous? Yeah. These people believe in magical underwear and that the Bible was uh, dictated to a guy named Joseph Smith who was like staying in a holiday inn or something. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> the whole musical is a brilliant satire about how insane that is Correct. to a degree, right? Yeah, yeah. And they, I guess they also, they're, they're slightly tone deaf when it comes to Africans because it's satirizing Mormons. Correct. Who are probably racist. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's the whole point, right? The whole point is for you to go, look how ridiculous. Right. Look how absurd. Mm -hmm. Not, well, they got a point. Right. But that's the fear. Mm -hmm. The fear is that people go there and they sit down in a Broadway theater in the middle of Manhattan and go, yep, they're right. They're right about black people. <laughs> they're wrong about everything else they believe, about magical underwear and Joseph Smith, who was like some drunk who uh, came up with some dumb, like, they're, they're wrong about all that, and the temple, you have to go, yeah, they're wrong about all that, but, so, uh, it's absurd to me, this is the, was the most successful Broadway show, in, you know, other than Hamilton, in, like, history, Book of Mormon was so incredibly successful, nobody was upset at Book of Mormon, it was widely understood that this was a parody of people that believed absurd things, okay, and now people are going, we have to adapt. Correct. We have to change it. It's interesting when you look at Trey Parker and Matt Stone, who are probably the most brilliant satirists yes. of our time and political social commentary. Nobody really does it better. And people going, let's change it. Let's take a step back and let's change it. And I don't know. It just seems like it, it's never ending. And then In the Heights comes out, Lin-Manuel Miranda. People go, well, it's colorism. Uh, the Latin people are not Afro-Latino. I don't know. Listen, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, it's a great quote. We're letting the perfect become the enemy of the good. If it is good to have more representation, which I think it is, it's clearly good, as long as it's based on talent, right? And merit and finding people that are really good at what they do and not softening uh, the entire space to where you're elevating mediocre people based solely on, uh, you know, box checking. But if, if, if you have people that are super talented, which in many cases they do, this is a great positive thing, but let's not let the perfect become the enemy of the good. Nothing's going to be. And it's, it's also whose idea is perfect. We don't know what perfect is, but certain people's idea of like, everything has to check every box and be the most. And it's like, we're, we're losing, Art can't function like that. It can't. It just simply cannot. And all the people that dismiss these concerns and go like, this is all old people that are like, hey, I, I can't go on stage and hate transgender people anymore. Sure, there's an element of that. But I think the more you know, reasonable people are saying all these things are a net positive. Diversity, different voices, different stories, things like that. It matters how it's done, and it, it matters that the art is first, the comedy's first, whatever you're doing happens to be first, and you're not pathologizing everything into a political statement. You're making something great and including other people for no other reason than the fact that they enrich the, the work and make it better. It's crazy that SNL never had a, an Asian person on. It's crazy that they didn't have a black woman on. I've said that. Black women are probably the naturally funniest group of people over a certain age, usually over 40. But it's crazy that SNL, but it's all these white liberal 
uh, you know, Harvard guys that all you people want to be ruled by all the time. All you people, they, they seem to escape. As long as you're a tall Ivy League white guy, you seem to get out of the, you seem to get out of that, and they everybody still, you know, builds a statue to you on the Temple Mount. Um, I don't cast SNL. You know, they probably had some blind spots. They certainly did. But, you know, we've taken it to a level here where it's, you know, where it's getting absurd. You know, it, it, you know, if every single story just has to have the most mar the most marginalized people truly are dead people. Right? They're not alive. They don't have the privilege of even drawing breath. So if we take this to its logical conclusion, we're all necrophiliacs. <laughs> Because if you're alive, there's some level of privilege in being alive. So if we're just going to do, if we're just going to have, we're just going to have, we're going to have to put a bunch of corpses in a room and call it the Christmas story. If, if that's what we're really going to do. Because now people are like, well, you have, you're ableist. You can walk. You're neurotypical. You're not autistic. You're cisgendered. So you're the gender that you were born as. You're straight. You're not queer. You're, you know, so, so again, we just, we're going down the line here and it just seems a little ridiculous. And, and we all know that. And there's really no way out of it per se. So that's why there'll probably be some type of, uh, there's a split happening and it's pretty big. The people that are on TV right now that have their own shows have far less followers on Twitter and Instagram than I do and other people that are online. One of the reasons for that is the eyeballs are leaving TV and they're going to the internet. How do people try to colonize the internet? What a word, colonize. We don't know, but it's coming. It's coming, and you see the split. And the people that are on one side of the split are in, in a fit of rage. I don't care. I can enjoy shows like Hacks on HBO and say they're fun shows, but... A lot of the same people in that part of the entertainment business are somehow angry that there's people online that have money and that have a following. Uh, and the people in the media that work for major corporations and networks are angry that there are people that are on Substack writing and having a following. So you see a theme here. You see this decentralization happening and a lot of people are not happy about it. There's a lot of people that are angry about it and they're going to do something. They keep trying to do something. The problem is the money is with us for the moment. The, the people want the content. We have the freedom right now and it's making money because it resonates with people because we can do what within reason, what we want to do. And we hope it stays like that, you know, but if not, I will with Hunter Biden start a podcast and it will be great.